A San Diego congressman is calling on the Department of Homeland Security to improve training after footage of a teenager who died at the San Ysidro port of entry is released. They don't understand how gang documentation affects not only their lives, but the lives can affect the lives of their children's children. Marked for life, San Diego activists are challenging a state law that can have long-term consequences. And an experience of a lifetime, San Diego students travel overseas to document the refugee crisis in Greece. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. Video of a Mexican teenager drinking methamphetamine at the border has a local congressman asking for better training for border agents. The teenager died. KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero has more. Cruz Velasquez Acevedo died in 2013 after drinking liquid meth. He was allegedly encouraged to do it by Customs and Border Protection officers in San Ysidro. He was 16. The U.S. government gave the family a $1 million settlement earlier this year. The incident has captured the attention of several members of Congress after video of the incident aired for the first time on ABC last week. The family's attorney, Jean Iredell, shared the video with KPBS. In it, two customs officers can be seen gesturing at Velasquez to drink from the bottles of liquid meth and laughing when he does. Court records say the officers asked the boy to drink the liquid to prove it was apple juice as he claimed. Attorney Jean Iredell says the customs officers should have simply tested the liquid with kits they have on hand. This was a 16-year-old boy who was doing something admittedly wrong, who was doing something for which he deserved possibly to be punished, certainly to be brought before the court and called upon to answer for his conduct. But instead, these agents decided to have a little fun at his expense and take the risk that they imposed on him that he would die, which is exactly what happened. Customs and Border Protection confirmed that the officers involved in the incident were never disciplined because the agency did not find that further action was warranted. San Diego Congressman Juan Vargas told KPBS in an emailed statement that he is requesting an immediate response from the Department of Homeland Security to ensure that proper training is put in place. The Department of Homeland Security plans to hire thousands of new officers in coming months. Iredell says this makes it all the more urgent to implement new training to make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. The city of San Diego has approved an ordinance requiring city contractors to pay employees equally regardless of race or gender. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen has more. Equal pay laws already exist at the state and federal level, but a report last March by the National Partnership for Women and Families found Latina women in California are paid 44 cents for every dollar earned by a white, non-Hispanic male. That's the second worst pay gap for Latinas in the country. Councilman Chris Ward proposed the city's equal pay ordinance. We can set the standard in the region for a way that empowers all working people without creating any additional uh, burdens for businesses. Ultimately, it makes sure that our economy is working for everyone and that the city is, make, is being a leader to make that happen. So before I... Employees of companies that do business with the city can file complaints of wage discrimination under the ordinance. After that, the businesses may have to open up their books to scrutiny by city officials. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Joe Arpaio, the controversial former sheriff of Maricopa County, Arizona, has been convicted of contempt for refusing to stop traffic patrols targeting immigrants. A judge ruled it was racial profiling. Contempt of court is a misdemeanor in Arizona, punishable by up to six months in jail. Arpaio's lawyers say they will appeal. California has a law that says people who associate with known gang members are seen in gang neighborhoods or wear gang-related clothing can be listed in the state's gang database. A local group of activists is fighting these gang designations. They're holding a conference on the issue next weekend. KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser has the story. What I want out of it is, is, is to educate people 
um, around our community that don't understand what gang documentation is. Brandon Tiny Dude Duncan knows California's gang documentation laws well. He went to jail for allegedly associating with gang members who were accused in a shooting. But seven months later, a judge dismissed the charges against him. They don't understand how gang documentation affects not only their lives, but the lives can affect the lives of their children's children. To help raise awareness, he and other organizers from the nonprofit Pillars of the Community are putting on a conference this weekend called Document Me. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, black, brown, and Asian unity, why it's needed, uh, how we go about doing it. Um, and also uh, real consequences of, of these labels uh, that you know society gives people of color, criminal, thug, felon, gang member, and things like that. Community organizer Aaron Harvey was also arrested under the gang conspiracy law with charges dismissed. He says the experience forced him to get involved. It kind of put us in a position where we didn't really have much of a choice, right? So uh, even though you know we're out here fighting for our community and fighting for other communities. Uh, I'm also fighting for my life as well. The day-long conference is free and open to anyone. It will be held at the Educational Culture Complex in the Mount Hope neighborhood of Southeast San Diego. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. Building bridges with entertainment and togetherness. Tomorrow is National Night Out. The city of San Diego is hosting a number of events in celebration of this annual promotion of police community relations. Here's images from last year. Tuesday, starting at 4, there will be games, free food, and entertainment at Jeremy Henwood Memorial Park in City Heights. The fun will be followed by a march from 7 to 7.30. The night is also designed to give neighbors a chance to get to know know one another and take pride in their communities. California is funding a trial program that could bring cutting edge renewable systems to low income communities around the state. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson has details. The California Energy Commission is bankrolling a plan to bring renewable energy to a mobile home park near Bakersfield, California. The money will allow for the installation of solar panels and a battery storage system. Now, the idea is to make the technology available to communities that couldn't otherwise afford it. The combination is expected to cut that community's power bills by 40 percent. Tim Sassine works for the San Diego-based Center for Sustainable Energy. He says this could be the future for low-income communities around the state. We expect solar and storage combined to be a dominant form of power generation in the, in the future without question. And many people in the industry are looking towards that as well. The costs for energy storage are dropping radically. Sassine says the project is funded by a $2 million grant from the California Energy Commission. It could change the impact of solar systems by making them available in places where they might not otherwise be set up. Now, if this project is a success, others are expected to follow. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. There's a new online tool to help San Diegans get better prepared for wildfires and other natural disasters. KPBS video journalist Katie Shulove has more. We call on every San Diegan to know your hazards, know your hazards on your property where you live, know the hazards where you are doing business or where you are working. Starting today, it's a lot easier to do just that. The County Office of Emergency Services has unveiled a Know Your Hazards map, which lets people type in their specific address to see the level of risk they face for earthquakes, flooding and tsunami hazards, and wildfires. This location shows particular risk for wildfire hazard. Office of Emergency and Services Director Holly Crawford gave a demo of how the map works and says preparation is especially important because of the types of emergencies we face here in San Diego. Because almost all of our hazards are no notice. Unlike the East Coast where you watch for days as a hurricane churns towards you, we don't have that luxury. The emergencies that you could face at your home, you may have less than 15 minutes to evacuate. County Fire Chief Tony Meacham says this year's fire threat is especially high because of six years of drought. So individuals need to use the new map to check their risk level and prepare an emergency kit to speed up evacuations in case they're necessary. We could add hundreds and hundreds of fire engines, but until we get the individual homeowners and our community members to understand the threat and take some ownership uh, of being their own advocate, 
we're never going to eliminate that wildland fire threat in San Diego. Meacham suggests signing up to receive emergency alerts on your cell phone as well. You can find alert registration and the new interactive map at readysandiego.org. Katie Shulev, KPBS News. San Diego State researchers say Internet searches about suicide rose earlier this year after the release of the popular Netflix flick series, 13 Reasons Why. The show examines the anguish and eventual suicide of a teenage girl. Researchers monitored all suicide queries on Google between the release date of March 31st and April 18th. Lead researcher John Ayers says all suicide-related searches were 19 percent higher than expected during that time frame. Ayers says an alarming percentage of that increase came from phrases like how to commit suicide. When people search for how to commit suicide or how to painlessly kill themselves, they're just one step away from that final suicide act. And that's very troubling. And it also because the show violated the World Health Organization's standards on how to report on suicide. In a written statement, Netflix says we are looking forward to more research and taking everything we learn to heart as we prepare for season two. California isn't doing enough to make sure school children are eating foods sourced from the U.S. That's according to a state auditor's report that says more school districts are turning to produce from foreign suppliers. The study finds education officials are failing to enforce the Buy American requirement in schools. The federal initiative requires school lunch programs to purchase foods processed in the U.S. as much as possible. Sacramento rightly considers itself the farm to fork capital, uh, and yet we have many local school districts that are electing to purchase products from half a world away when we have local farmers and local food processors that are capable of supplying those very same products to our local schools. California congressional lawmakers are criticizing Department of Education officials and are calling for stronger state legislation on school food programs to be put in place. Every year, high school students at Pacific Ridge School in Carlsbad get to do something few students do. Pick a spot on the globe and fly there. Some go to learn a language or do community service. Three students decided to go beyond the headlines to document the migrant crisis in Greece. KPBS education reporter Megan Burks sat down with them to talk about what they learned from behind the camera. More than 46,000 migrants and refugees have made the journey to Greece where they're seeking a safe haven. Greek is it's not a country for the refugee people. 33 people, including five children. Everyone hears the numbers, everyone hears the suffering that people are going through, but we actually met the people, we had lunch with them, um, we they wanted to take selfies with us, ask us questions. And especially with a lot of media being especially polarized with the election and other political things going on, we felt that we wanted a straightforward approach and like the truth out of the situation mm -hmm. instead of polarized media. Based on what you'd seen in the news, what image did you have in your head that you would maybe see as you were flying over there and then compare it to what you did see on the ground? Definitely before I'd ever met any refugees or gotten involved in this, I was picturing just people lying around on the ground in horrible conditions, mm -hmm. people you know, coming over and kicking them maybe because of this um, supposed increasing backlash that was going on, and just really, really horrible conditions and constant flow of people. But when we got there, and really practically every situation I've seen involving migrants is that they're just regular people going about their lives, you know, kids playing around or buying food at the grocery store or, you know, talking with other people, doing projects is very, definitely very different from what I had expected. So one thing you guys dealt with on this trip was whose story was it to tell and how far would you go into the refugee camps and that kind of thing. Will you tell me about that? Because we were such a large group of 15 really privileged kids from Southern California, um, it seemed awkward to go in with the entire group and go into a, a refugee camp. But just driving past the camps when we were in the bus was very striking because it, it, to me, it did not look like a camp. It looked like a prison. You had three to four layers of barbed wire fencing and then long rows of basically storage containers with tiny windows cut in every 15 feet. So it was going to have to be baking in there because it was in the middle of summer in the Mediterranean. Um, we didn't capture any of that on camera. It wasn't necessarily the point, purpose of the documentary. 
but omitting that from any of the documentaries we made leaves a very different image of what's going on than what we conveyed. Yeah, we heard the stories of the bad from people who are now in the better. Not the good, but the better. Yeah, I mean, I think going into the field, you have to work with the timing, with your sources, with the angle that that you have. Um, so a little bit of it is incumbent on the viewer to make sure that they go in and get that full picture. So what's your advice for news consumers? As many sources, watch, read, listen to as many sources as possible. And Jonah, so moving forward, working in media, um, are there practices that you think you'll you'll take with you having gone on this trip? The ambitions and the goals and the dreams that a lot of uh, the people who are going through the refugee crisis have are very pertinent and very real, and it's not just a story of sadness and tragedy, although that is a factor. These people who have gone through, you know, usually some very horrible things, had to leave their family, um, all the stuff you hear about on the media, are just trying to have regular lives. They don't want to be labeled as, you know, a migrant. They want to be, you know, a doctor or a teacher, and ha they happen to have a background of having to move their countries. So. I think no matter what profession people are going into, just understanding that people have a shared humanity. My own understanding has grown so much to be that I don't know what's happening really. The more questions that you have just lead to more and more questions rather than answers. And so I think that a lot of times kind of towards what Elliot was saying, so many people are closed minded, they think they know the facts. Um, but in reality, if you think you know everything, you probably know half as much as what you really do. Um, <laughs> And I think that the more open you are to trying to learn more information, the better, mm -hmm. because you will never know everything. It's impossible. There's too much to know. <laughs> Isn't it frustrating? You think as you get older, you're, you'll start to get the answers, and then what you actually get is this understanding that you will never get yeah. the answers. There's just a hell of a lot more questions every yeah, time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That was KPBS education reporter Megan Burks talking with Pacific Ridge school students about their trip to Greece. Other classmates traveled to 10 other countries, including China, Cuba, and India. A new pedestrian crossing into Mexico is opening tonight. It's in San Ysidro, just west of the original San Ysidro point of entry. The southbound lanes are part of Ped West, a pedestrian crossing facility that launched last year with only northbound lanes. The new lanes will give people a third way to walk into Mexico, in addition to the Otay Mesa and the east San Ysidro pedestrian crossing lanes. Well, it looks like the Summer Olympics are coming back to Los Angeles. The city reached an agreement with the International Olympic leaders today to open the way for L.A. to host the Games in 2028. L.A. and Paris were the last two bids remaining. Several cities, including Boston, withdrew from consideration because they weren't willing to bear the financial burden of hosting the event. How familiar does this sound? A professional sports stadium with no professional sports team sitting in a huge expanse of asphalt. We're talking about the Houston Astrodome, which has been vacant for a decade. Like San Diego's Qualcomm Stadium, there have been a lot of ideas about what to do with the site. The spanking new Astrodome is the new $31 million home of the Houston Astros been around since 1965. A dome stadium that holds nearly 50,000 for a baseball game. People grew up going to ball games there. there all kinds of events happen there. Plastic ceiling makes it an all-weather stadium. When it was built, there was nothing like it. There was nothing even close to the 643 foot span. It was never done before. The winner by a technical knockout and still heavyweight champion of the world, Cassius Clay. What I think is really important about the dome is that it has these kind of individual meanings for different people. It has to do with what went on inside, what event you saw, who you were with. As the Astrodome gets ready to shut its doors after 35 years of hosting Major League Baseball. The... I realized this building is very important to Houston. And I started thinking about it as an architect. And the more I looked at it, the biggest innovation in the dome is in, in the engineering. So I thought, well, let's remove the, the exterior envelope and celebrate the structure. But then you have this kind of problem where, what do you do with that? I've worked for a lot of architects all over the world, and, and the ones that I really enjoyed working for are ones who kind of look at every problem differently and, and come up with different solutions. North and South Boulevards are very famous for the live oak trees. 
it's kind of like an unexposed structure. And then on top of that, it has a kind of infrastructure that lives on it, which is incredible. It has ferns and birds and squirrels' nests, and it's just a really amazing experience just to walk under those trees and experience the, the shade also that you get from it. It's not quite an enclosed space, and it's not quite unclosed. That's what the dome will become, just on an enormous scale. So that became the A-Dome Park. I have a partner in this, Ben Elshner. Architects want to make the world sort of a better place. This is a concept. I'm not saying this is what's moving forward. The dome is currently surrounded by parking. There's 26,000 parking spaces. And that what happens is the sun shines down on that black asphalt and the heat actually radiates off the asphalt. Actually, the temperature rises. There's a term for it called a heat island. So we surround the dome with a park, almost 40 acres. So that park space would be shaded, cooled space with water absorbing grass surface around it. One of the highlight features of it would be a ramp that goes all the way to the top of the dome. So you, you could imagine running up there in the morning, it would be a two, almost a two mile run to the top of the dome. You can imagine walking or running up there in the morning and seeing the sunrise over the gulf. And then the center of the dome, we call this other piece of infrastructure, the great floor. And the great floor would be a place where any kind of event can happen, a rock concert, the, the rodeo, anything you could imagine. To have the, the dome unenclosed and to have this infrastructure in it would be really a, an incredibly unique feature for the city. It would be like the Eiffel Tower of Houston. We've had tremendous response to our project. People feel like that would be a very attractive thing to do with the Astrodome. You know, it's not a baseball stadium anymore. They play downtown. It's not a football stadium. There's a football stadium right next to it. So what is it? That's the question, right? That story from KUHT Public Television in Houston. You can find more stories like that one on SciTech Now Sunday nights at 530 right here on KPBS. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour lessons from Watergate. I talked to William Ruckel's house, a key figure in the Saturday night massacre. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. A warmer, partially cloudy day with a high tide advisory in effect for southern facing beaches. Regina Miller has tonight's forecast. Well, we've got some unusually sticky conditions here across uh, Southern California, and we've had some moisture to the east. The monsoonal moisture is moving in, and that is going to bring us a chance for some isolated showers and a thunderstorm to the area as well. You can see some of that moisture coming across into uh, southeastern parts of California here, coming from Arizona. Now, tonight in the metro areas, we will have areas of low clouds, a temperature of 69 degrees, and as we look across the area here. Borrego Springs, Mount Laguna, we could see a thunderstorm in the area here. There's always the concern as well for some flash flooding with any thunderstorms that do erupt in these locations. We're into uh, tomorrow even going to see that as far westward as some of the beaches where we could see shower thunderstorm. We do have your typical heat, uh, very warm conditions, but we have the stickiness as well, so that's going to make it feel uh, quite a bit more uncomfortable. So in uh, to Oceanside, we're at 82 degrees, Borrego Springs, 106, 81 in Mount Laguna. We've got those uh, scattered showers and an isolated thunderstorm around the area for tomorrow. And a look at the coastal forecast, even on Wednesday, there could be a thunderstorm in spots. Again, there's always that concern that we could have some spots getting flash flooding. Even on Thursday, a chance for a thunderstorm in spots. By Friday, then, just partly sunny and 84 degrees. Inland locations, a thunderstorm in spots on Tuesday at 91, 93 on Wednesday with a thunderstorm in spots, even on Thursday, partly sunny and warm for Friday. On Tuesday in the mountain locations, showers and a thunderstorm. There'll be showers and thunderstorms also on Wednesday, even into Thursday. Friday can't rule out a thunderstorm as well. Be careful. Again, there could be some issues with some flash flooding here with any of these storms. On Tuesday in the desert locations, 106 showers and thunderstorms. Same thing on Wednesday and Thursday with temperatures topping 100, partly sunny and warm on Friday. I'm Regina Miller, KPBS News.
Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Sam Shepard has died at his home in Kentucky. The 73-year-old was possibly even better known from the silver screen. The Oscar-nominated actor had a long career. He starred opposite Dolly Parton and Julia Roberts in Still Magnolias and Diane Keaton in Baby Boom. More recently, he played Robert Rayburn in the HBO series Bloodline. Doctors reportedly diagnosed Shepard with ALS. There was a disturbance in the force in Claremont over the weekend. Star Wars icon Mark Hamill was in town for a ceremony, unveiling a street sign in his honor. It's on a section of Castleton Drive where Hamill lived with his family in the 1960s. He spent four years here and says he would pick this city as his hometown if he could. Now, here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. It's one of the largest bri bribery scandals in the history of the Navy. A Malaysian businessman using money and wild sex parties to coax Navy officers into steering ships to ports he owned in the Pacific. We'll look at the ongoing Fat Leonard investigation. That's tomorrow on KPBS Radio. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.